I just need a sec to share my screen. All right, you should see my screen now. Just one sec. All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Kari Bailey, and welcome to today's New York City Open Data 101 session. Thank you for coming to this session to learn more about New York City Open Data, especially on a Sunday morning. Um, as Kate said, I'm an Open Data Ambassador, which is a program that trains volunteers to teach about New York City Open Data. The material for this training was co-created by the Office of Data Analytics at the New York City Office of Technology and Innovation and the Civic Technology Organization, Beta NYC. And they also co-run the Open Data Ambassadors Program. So what is open data? Kate briefly talked about it, but open data can be simply defined as making government data more accessible to the public. Open data is often thought of as a 21st century phenomenon because of the growing importance of data in our everyday lives and from the increased creation and use of data um, by governments, both in New York City and around the world. But there's an earlier history of efforts to make, new, to make um, government more accountable and transparent. So to get a better understanding of how we got here, I'm going to briefly touch on some developments that led to New York City Open Data. So the roots of open data movement in New York City can be traced to good, good government efforts in the late 1800s and the progressive era of government reform in the late 19th century and early 20th century. There was a movement to reform how city government was running as a, as a result of the Tammany Hall political machine and this was in the wake of city scandals and corruption. So the city record, which was published in 1873, uh, you can see it on the screen here, it came out of this movement to make government more transparent. And around this time, actually, the Department of Investigations was also created. The city record essentially is a central repository for information about city solicitations, public notices, purchases, and hiring. And it still exists today, both in print and online. So jumping into the 1960s, there was the Freedom of Information legislation, which you might know as FOIA or FOIL. FOIL made government information available upon request. If you know what you're looking for, you can ask for it. And if that information exists and can be shared, it will be shared with you. In some cases, the now public records are shared more widely, like published in an article, but often the only person to ever see the records is the requester. With FOIL, most government information is available if someone asks for it. And at the time, this was a revolutionary con uh, concept. The Freedom of Information Act became federal law in 1967, and New York State passed its own in 1974. Several decades later, in 1993, New York City released a public data directory which you can see on this slide. And this made a subset of information available through FOIL, information stored as data, more accessible by providing a listing of what data agencies have. This is in contrast with a FOIL request where the person making the request needs to know in advance what they're looking for. But with this public directory, someone could now see a listing of data that was available at each agency and read a description of what it contained. So on this slide, you can see to the right, um, there's an example of the Department of Buildings listing, and it says there's a database that includes a list of public complaints on building work sites and existing structures. So if you were looking at this directory in the 90s and you wanted it, um, you could request the agency to provide this information either on a CD or a printout. Moving into the 2000s, um, in 2012, advocates, city staff, and elected officials came together to celebrate the passage of New York City's open data law. While many cities have open data as policy or executive order, New York City is unique in a sense that it's written to the law and to the city charter that the public will have access to this information permanently, regardless of who's in administration. So a key difference between open data and FOIL is that no one needs to ask for this information. It's made public by default and shared with everyone by default on the New York City Open Data website. So what does open data physically look like in the real world today? Well, public data is available on nearly every faucet of city life. This is an illustration of some, some of New York City's open data that shows how the physical environment links to open data sets. Um, shouting out to the audience, can anyone guess where this is? 
or where this data, where data may be collected where, free, feel free to come off mute or put in the chat where you think this might be or where some of the data points are. Union Square. Right. Yeah, someone said Union Square, yep. Yeah. That is correct. This is Union Square at um, 14th Street and Broadway. And as you can see in this illustration, um, for every paved street, there's a data set about that or a recycling bin um, or a restaurant inspection. There's many data points that you can see on just about city life. So what makes something NYC open data? To get a better sense of what it is and what it's not, New York City open data, I'm gonna go over a few examples. So the first criteria for being open data is that it's the information needs to be machine readable. This generally means that something that's presented in a table with rows and columns or in a standardized format that a computer can understand. This can include maps. For example, there's a map of New York City trees on open data and accompanying it has, has a table where each row is a tree with columns to indicate that the tree's species, its size, and its latitude and longitude and more information. But other maps, like the one you're seeing on the screen, which is actually the original plan for Central Park, it doesn't have the same equivalent table. So it would not be on the open data website because it's not machine readable. Another criteria is that the data cannot be private or confidential. Data sets are closely reviewed for personal information before they're, pu they're posted publicly. In a few instances where there's an important reason for members of the public to have access to otherwise private information, this data set can be made public. For example, what you're seeing on the screen now is a data set of city employee names and salaries. It's called the city, citywide payroll data. And this is made public, but something that would have personal home addresses would not be on open data. And as of 2022, the New York City Open Data website contains more than 3,000 data sets, billions of rows of data, and is managed by the New York City Open Data team housed at the New York City Office of Technology and Innovation. This wealth of information is only made possible thanks to a network of over 100 open data coordinators that are spread throughout city government. And each agency, office, or commission, including elected officials, has an open data coordinator. And these open data coordinators are well-versed in their agency's data. They're responsible for working with New York City Open Data team to identify, structure, document, publish, update, and share their agency's open data data sets. So now that I've gone through some brief history of New York City Open Data and what New York City Open Data means today, let's take a closer look at the actual NYC Open Data portal. You can access the portal at nyc.gov slash open data. And this is the page you'll see when you go to the website. And from this landing page, you can easily search for a topic that you're interested in. As you can see on this highlight in red, that's the search bar where you can search for topics or certain agencies. You can also click on the data link tab highlighted in red at the top, where you can see an overview of the more than 3,000 data sets on open data. So when you click on the data page, this is what the page will look like. If you want to just browse data sets and you're not searching for something specific or a certain agency, you can see data, an overview of the data in different, grouped in a number of different ways. So for example, in the bottom you see data sets by agency. You can search data sets by category, like business, health, education, and more. You can also check out the most popular data sets, or you can check out what, what's new, what are the newest uh, data sets that are public. But going back to the open data homepage, let's look at a specific data set by typing 311 into the search bar. Before we see the results of the search, I'm gonna go on a quick tangent, just about a little information about 311. So 311 is a New York City government resource for assistance and general information outside of emergency situations. It's open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and it's available in over 175 languages and it represents roughly 3,600 government services. So this is a large operation and it's, it's pretty accessible via phone, web, Twitter, Facebook, and mobile apps. And the data set that we're about to view happens to be one of the most popular data sets on New York City Open Data. So among other things, um, the data set contains information about New Yorkers' complaints and requests for city services. So let's take a look. When we enter 311 into the search, 
This is, you'll get back a list of the results as you see on the screen. And for this exercise, the, the results we want to see is the top one highlighted in red. 311 service request from 2010 to present. So when you, once you click on that data set, it will bring you to this page and you'll see an overview of this data. This page is also known as the primer page. And it gives you a description of the data and what's in the data set. As you can see, highlighted in red, um, it tells you the number of rows and columns, and it says that each row represents a request. It also tells you the date that the data was last, last updated. You can also find the update frequency. In this case, the 311 data set is updated daily. But you can also view um, how much this data has been viewed and downloaded. This particular day that the screenshot, this happened to have 442K views, but I'm sure at this point, it's probably more than that. So in addition, on this primer page, something very useful that you want to especially take a look at is in the attachment page, there's a data dictionary, which is a document that's meant to teach you what's in the data. So let's take a closer look about what this looks like. The data dictionary gives you a description of each column in the data set. Since sometimes the column names are not always self-explanatory, it contains notes to further explain details of how the data is created and used. I highly recommend that you check the data dictionary before digging into a data set in order to aid in the understanding of what this data means. So once you get a sense of the data set's context, you can click the View Data Set tab highlighted in the red box to look at the data. So let's do before we do that, um, this is, there's an important thing when you're viewing the data is that now that you've looked at the New York City Open Data Portal homepage, the search tab and the data tab, I want to explore with you uh, viewing the data and filtering it for information that you may want. So when you click the view data tab, this page will come up and this is where it will lead you. And this 311 data set that we search for. And you can see highlighted in red that the 311 data set is a table with 41 columns and more than 27 million rows. So instead of trying to scroll through all these records, which contain every request in every corner of New York City since 2010, you can easily filter to see specific data you're interested in. Because filtering is recommended when you're dealing with an especially large data set, it's hard to work with a data set that has millions of records. So we're just going to see um, this filter button at the top highlighted in red, um, and it will bring down a drop down of the filter options. And you can select different things to filter. In this example, we'll filter um, this 311 to only show Queens Community Board 1, which you see highlighted in the box. Um, but as you can see, there's still tons of records. There's more than 546,000 uh, records. So what can we do? Well, we can filter the data down even more to what we specifically are interested in. In this example, um, we'll filter not only by community board, but also um, the created date of the record and by a specific agency. In this case, um, I chose the Department of Sanitation. So now after adding all those filters, we see um, we're only seeing the records that show all the 311 calls made in Queens Community Board 1 after January 1st, 2020, 2021, um, and assigned to the Department of Sanitation. And you might be able to see, or it might be a little small, but this really narrowed down our records to about um, 290, so almost 300 records, which is a lot more manageable than like millions and millions of rows. So once you filter the data for what you need, you can then download it to a, that smaller filter data set to your computer in a variety of formats. You can do that by clicking the export button highlighted at the top, and then you select the format, the drop down of format options highlighted in the big box on the screen. And as you can see, there's many options, but the most common format for using data in Excel or Google Sheets is a CSV for Excel. So now that we saw how to filter and download data, what if you wanted to look at a chart or a graph of this data? You could download the data to your computer, so you can use it in Excel or Google Sheets. But if you just wanted to explore a data set graphically, you could also easily create a visualization without leaving, without leaving the Open Data website or downloading. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So let's explore how we can visualize data on the Open Data website. 
To begin, we're back on the primer page. And in, instead of viewing data, you can click the visualize tab highlighted in red. And the visualize, visualization button brings you here. And first you can select the type of visualization you want. As you see, it's highlighted in the box. There's many options and icons. And then once you select, in this case, I'm gonna select the pie chart. And after I select the pie chart, um, the filter menu options on the right side of the screen, um, you, you can create what you wanna filter by. So in this example, I'm gonna filter by the create date. And then finally, the panel on the left allows you to select the category of data you would like to present, as well as how you want to present it. So in this example, I selected to count the number of calls by borough. And what does this leave us with? This leaves us with a pie chart of 311 inquiries that were created on 32121, broken down by each borough. So let's take a look at another visualization. Using this icon at the top highlighted in red, it's a little globe. And you can actually visualize the data on a map. In this example, I am going to filter by 311 requests that were created yesterday. And as you can see, they it was plotted on the map and it shows where the 311 requests were submitted across New York City on a previous day. Another example of a visualization is a bar chart. So to do this, you would also click on the icons to the bar chart and filter in this example, let's say we filtered by agency, the Department of Transportation, and also in the left side, the created date, um, the data selection could be by complaint type. So after you put in all your filters, pick the um, bar chart, this is an example of what you can see. So this shows different types of DOT complaints between March 1st through 2nd, in 2021. And if you look a little closer, so the complaint types, you can see street conditions, light, traffic signals, and it gives you the number of complaints on a specific date range. So now that you've seen how to filter and visualize data sets on New York City Open Data Portal, I will now show you other tools that use New York City Open Data. On the New York City Open Data website, there is something called the Open Data Project Gallery which is essentially a library of tools that build on New York City open data. And it's a view into how people are using New York City data to create tools and visualizations of their own. So I'm gonna give, show you an example of it shortly, but I also wanna tell you another tool before digging into um, the web page. Another tool, so the project gallery has, has tools that were created by the general public and nonprofit organizations and not, it's not necessarily city agencies. But there's many other maps and tools that are directly created by city agencies to make their data more accessible to the public. And most of these tools have an equivalent open data data set. And so if you want to see tools that were specifically created by city agencies, you can find them at nyc.gov maps. And now I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a sec, and I'll show you two of the tools. One um, that is part of the project gallery and another one that is part of city agency. So this is directly on the New York City Open Data website. You would find, if you want to find the project gallery, you would go to the Learn tab and Project Gallery, and there it would show you um, basically uh, thumbnails of different projects. And this one, I clicked into a specific one called NYC Crash Mapper, and it gives you a little description of like what it is. Um, it's a dashboard and a map, a way to see transportation. Um, it gives you a brief description and it says this tool is, it allows advocates, press, and elected officials to prioritize the most dangerous intersections um, in order to keep track about Vision Zero. Um, it also tells you what data set this map used. And in this case, it used the NYP motor vehicle collision data set. And you can also find information about who created this. So let's look at the actual tool. I'm going to launch the project a little sec for it to load. Okay, and this is the New York City Crash Mapper. It's a useful tool to see crashes over time um, and displayed over the map. So I, as an example, okay, so let's say we wanted to look at crashes um, from last year, January 2020 of last year to January 22. 
And then you can also, so once you have your date range that you want to look at, you can also filter by citywide, borough, community district. Um, so let's just do by borough. Actually, I think it's better to see citywide and then zoom out. I'm going to zoom out so you can see a little bit. You can also filter by crash type. So if you just wanted to see cyclists, fatalities, or motorists, um, in this case, let's just say I wanted to see only fatalities. So I only select cyclists, motorists, and pedestrians. You can also filter by a specific vehicle type involved. Like if you just wanted to look at e-bikes or motor or truck, you can do that as well. And you can also, once you have a map that you want or inf specific information that you filtered, you can download the data. So and let's check about the things that I filtered now. So now you should be seeing on the map um, that I filtered, um, I'm only looking at fatalities um, broken down by different types. So the red indicates all the only, it's only fat the crashes that resulted in fatalities. So you can see an overall at the bottom of the screen that from January 2021 to January 22, there was 19 um, cyclist fatalities and 126 uh, pedestrian and 136 motorists. It gives you a nice like recap of everything, but also if you wanna explore a specific area and a specific intersection, like let's say you're only, you, you're in a community district in this area, uh, or you just wanted to see kind of what the crashes were for a particular time period in your neighborhood, you can zoom in on that area and see a specific street. So just as this is an example, um, when you click on it, it gives you the total crashes for that intersection and where that intersection was. So this is a useful tool to monitor crashes in your area or if you want to advocate for certain inter intersections to be improved, um, you can pull the data for your specific district and say, hey, this is how many crashes happened this year during this time period and like we should fix it. So this is one of the many tools that are on the project gallery. I'm going to show you another one that is on the NYC Maps website and this is created by a city agency. I'm going to switch over to that tab. This is called, um, this is from the Department of City Planning. It's called Pop Population Backfinder and essentially it is a tool for you to visualize census data, um, which, in, which has multiple demographic information. So I'm gonna go right into the website and show you. So there's different, you can create a polygon or a radius over a certain area. You can look at it by census tract. You can select a neighborhood tabulation area or a community district. I am going to do it by neighborhood tabulation area. And as you can see, the screen changes to the geography that I clicked on. So let's say I wanted to look at Brooklyn Heights. I'm gonna click on Brooklyn Heights. Um, and there's also, you could add more things to the map if you wanted to, like subways, you can overlay zip codes, community districts, or New York City Council districts. But this example, let's just say I wanted to look at a specific area and see the demographics. So I clicked Brooklyn Heights and I'm gonna view the data for that. I will bring you to this page, it's loading, yeah. So this is the census information um, for this area and you can pick which year you want. I find it useful to see a change over time. So I'm gonna click that to see the cha change over time and population in the Brooklyn Heights neighborhood that I selected and then you can also see, choose which topics you want. But so let's say you just wanted to see population. You could do population or age or race or housing. Um, in this instance, I wanna see all of them and it will display each of them. So this is useful when, cause it allows you to compare two census results. Um, so the 2010 census to the 2020, and it gives you a table breakdown of the total population. So you can see that in Brooklyn Heights, um, from 2010 to 2020, the change in population grew in 2,205 people. And what you can do with this information that you selected about a certain area, you can download the data using this download button to the top right. 
but you can also copy the table to a clipboard if you want to insert it into a presentation or something else. So the population fact finder is a very useful tool if you want to get some quick facts about an area using the census, using census data. It's a quick way to compare um, different demographics over time. So now that I just went through a lot of information about the New York City Open Data as a program, how to get started using New York City Open Data, how to view and filter it, and some tools. Um, but now let's talk, let's take a step back and explore the reasons why someone would even be working with open data in the first place. So sometimes working with New York City Open Data can be purely exploratory and you just want to see what's out there. But oftentimes people work with open data because they have a specific problem they want to inform or questions that they're trying to answer through data. And having a question can come from your work or personal interest. Um, so I want to explore with you how you would use New York City Open Data to answer questions and solve problems. On this slide, you see a series of steps, which I'm now going to go step by step. This is just one way that you can answer um, and solve problems with open data. There is many other ways, but this is an example I'm going to explore with you. So the first step is to define the problem. So what's an example of a problem you could be trying to solve? Let's imagine you're working um, for a New York City government agency that would like to implement a support program for restaurants. They'd like to distribute small grants and loans to restaurants. Let's say you're the person in charge of developing this program and deciding which restaurants are going to receive funding. So how can you use New York City Open Data to support your work? Well, what you're going to start with is to see which data sets exist on New York City Open Data that can inform the problem you're trying to solve and then familiarize yourself with those data sets. So to find data sets, you would go to the New York City Open Data website and search for key terms like business, restaurant, and others. And so after you search those key terms, you'll see a list of data sets that correspond to each of the search terms, and you can identify data sets that are potentially interesting. On the right side of the slide, you'll see there's a list of data sets that are worth exploring based on the data set title and description. So as you can see, maybe legal knowing uh, what the legally operating businesses are, the um, WBE and other certified business lists, which is the woman, um, woman my, minority owned businesses. Um, you can also look at open restaurants inspections and health in, and restaurant inspection results, the New York City business acceleration business um, jobs created. There's a number of data sets that you can explore more. So let's, let's click into each data set to investigate further. Once you've identified data sets that are helpful in determining which restaurants should receive funding, the next step is to frame specific questions that get at this problem that can be answered using those data sets. So for example, we could ask the following questions in the right-hand corner. Which restaurants have received grade A inspection ratings in the last year? which restaurants have already received city support as part of the business acceleration program, and which restaurants currently employ the largest number of people. Um, and another question you could ask is, which restaurants are found in highly trafficked areas? The next step would be to see if a data set has, is able to answer a question. And as I might have mentioned before, a great way to fully understand any data set on New York City Open Data is to open up and read through its data dictionary. As mentioned earlier, data dictionaries provide useful high-level information about the data being collected, and they explain what each of the columns mean in more detail. So in this example, I opened the data set about New York City Business Acceleration Program, and I'm wondering if that program already provides the same kind of financial support that my city agency wants to offer. So if you take a, I'm not sure how deep you can see it, but Let's say we're reading this thing and you learn that no, the New York City Business Acceleration Program provides material support only, not financial support. So that's useful to know um, that businesses that are part of this program could still be eligible for your program because they have not already received financial support through another program. But if you still have questions about a, da uh, about a data set, even after reading the data dictionary, you can always contact the help desk. As much as the New York City Open Data Program tries to ensure that data dictionaries contain the most up-to-date information about a data set, it's still possible that after reading its data dictionary and looking through the data, you still have questions. So in that case, you can contact the help desk um, 
on the Open Data website by clicking Contact Us, and then a member of the Open Data team will be in touch with you to address your inquiry. So going back to looking at the data sets that help frame your questions to specific problems. So by looking, if we look at another data set, um, the restaurant inspection data set, you may want to identify which restaurants have received grade A inspection ratings in the last year. And you might want to only give funding to restaurants with grade A rating. But you look, if you look through the columns and identify the information that might be useful with rating, and highlighted in red, you can see maybe score would be useful or the grade columns might be ones you might particularly be interested in or violation, violation code and the description. But, and so after you've found helpful data sets and identified the relevant questions that can be answered using those data sets, you would then proceed to crunching some numbers and conducting analysis that answer your question. And you can summarize the results for clarity with visuals like tables, charts, or dashboards like the ones to the right. An example, um, after conducting with going back to the restaurant um, ratings, so let's say you, you, you thought the restaurant ratings uh, was going to be useful, um, but after conducting analysis on restaurant health inspections, you can see in the green bar chart at the bottom right corner that most restaurants have a grade A. It's the second um, column that a good amount have grade A, but more actually more, more restaurants actually don't have a grading at all. They're marked as no valuable, as you can see the column all the way to the left. So perhaps this data set is not as useful in helping you determine which restaurants should receive funding, because if you gave funding to restaurants with a grade A, you might be missing out on restaurants that don't have a rating. Another thing, so if you saw that there was no value and in the data dictionary, you, would, you should check to see what actually no value means or some of the other restaurant ratings, um, like grade pending, for example. And like I said before, if, if you don't find the answers to those questions in the data dictionary, you should contact the help desk. So after you've conducted analysis and gotten some answers to your questions, you should be better equipped to make decisions or provide stakeholders with recommendations. And that's it. That was the final step. And I hope through these step processes that we made an informed decision about distributing money to select restaurants with the support of New York City Open Data. So I've been talking a lot and I hope you learned a little bit more about New York City Open Data, its history and how to get started with the portal and how to use it to answer questions you might have. But you may be wondering how to get more involved with New York City Open Data for further. So I will tell you a few ways to stay engaged. The first one is you can ask a question or report an error to open data by, con by contacting the New York City Open Data Help. You can contact us or visit nyc.gov slash open data slash engage. And from this page, you can see on the screen, you can get assistance um, from the person or agency that manages the data that you're looking for. And if you can't find the data you're looking for, you can request a data set. If there's data that meets the definition of New York City Open Data, then the agency that manages it will be required to respond with the date when the when the data can be made available, or they have to give a public explanation of why it cannot be shared. So besides the help desk, you can also engage us um, by finding more data or reporting an error. Additionally, um, I showed a little bit about the project gallery, um, but I encourage you to explore this further. There's many, many ways, um, and it's constantly new projects are be being submitted to the project gallery. So I encourage you to check it out and explore tools that you're particularly interested in. You can also submit projects to the gallery, so I encourage you or others to do so. And as Kate mentioned, um, today is actually the last day of New York City Open Data Week 2022, but I hope to see everyone at next year's uh, Open Data Week. Um, you can still watch the recordings from previous years. Um, and as Kate might have mentioned, there's a lot of ranging uh, workshop panels, demos of specific data tools and more. Um, you can visit open-data.nyc to learn more and see um, recordings. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for attending this session. Um, I will now open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Great presentation, Kari. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, it could be specific questions about data that you're interested in um, or, you know, any curiosities. We're all ears. There's so many data sets. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to even know where to begin, but hopefully you have a clearer picture now. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I hope uh, you explore open data further. <laughs>